Look at this thing. It's bigger than my brain. I am recycling that joke from our book review five years ago because this book is long enough to warrant recycling. Anyways, Thomas Pynchon, Mason and Dixon, a really massive book. 773 pages or something. Pretty long, about the same length almost exactly as Gravity's Rainbow. And so I guess both of those books are about tied for second place in terms of length. Very complex book, a lot of threads going on, a lot of digressions. I want to compare it most, I mean, besides Pynchon's own books, you can compare it to, I guess, if you want. But non-Pynchon books that I would compare it to that it most resembles, I would say Don Quixote, actually. And because similar length and... Also, it just has this few characters that you follow along through the book, and there are a lot of tangents and digressions, and that's exactly what you're going to see in this book. Also, because a lot of it takes place in America, I found myself comparing it to Faulkner a little, uh, just this tapestry of characters. And um, I have to say, though, the first hundred pages or so on this reading, I was not into it as much as I remember being into it. I thought maybe that I wasn't going to enjoy it as much, but by the time I finished it, I did. It just took about 100 pages to kick in. But a good sign, when I finish a book, if I feel like I could go back to the beginning again and just start reading it again, that's a good sign, and that is the feeling I had when I finished this book. I, I am tempted to read it again, but, uh, you know, it took like six months or whatever on this, this reading, so I'm not going to do that. It's it's a bit too much of a time commitment right now. I have thought about maybe audiobooking again. It's, it is like something like Faulkner and Joyce that the more you become accustomed to it, the more you can enjoy it. So I do recommend audiobook. Maybe not for the first reading though. Either way, it is a 33 hour commitment for the audiobook. It's hard for me to recommend this book to just anyone. I think there are times when you will find it tiresome. And I think part of the problem was that I read most of this book sober, which I don't think is necessarily the best way to read Pynchon. The overall spirit is kind of rambunctious, but there are also moments of uh, <laughs> almost gothic or ghostly intrusions from the past. Oh, so what is this book about? So there's these two guys, Mason and Dixon, they're British, and they um, are put together to be part of this uh, observation of Venus, I want to say. It's been, it's been months since I've read that part, so it's, it's kind of fading into the past. But anyways, they, they were supposed to travel to, I believe, Sumatra, near you know modern Indonesia. But uh, I guess there were problems along the way, and they ended up stopping in Cape Town in South Africa. And then on the way back, they stopped at St. Helena, St. Helena, however you say that. And um, so basically, that's kind of like the first early parts of the book. They're just kind of getting to know each other, doing these scientific investigations. And as I said, along the way, there's all these tangents. But Pynchon has this frame that is given to him by history of things that he kind of has to be constrained by. But the thing about Mason and Dixon is that, I, I could be wrong about this, maybe there is a, a vast amount of biographical information that I don't know about, but if you look at the Wikipedia entry, it's pretty sparse and on um, the lives of these characters. And if you look, at, for example, at the pictures of them, these, I guess, are the best pictures we have of them. I, I don't know. I found on found, Find a Grave this picture, but I think somebody just uploaded it, so I don't even know if this is actually one of them. So anyways, these guys are enlisted by, um, I don't know, the king? <laughs> somebody in England appoints them to measure out this Mason-Dixon line to survey it because other surveyors had messed it up and not done it right or whatever. So they are sent to America and they're there for years surveying this line that would eventually, obviously if you know the name Mason-Dixon line, you think of it as separating border between the North and the South. So this is something that, Pynchon is like taking these very personal lives and their experiences as real human beings. like they're, they go so far beyond just names that they are actual people that you can understand and uh, turn them into something that affected, you know, empires or at least, you know, the American nation in the future in the Civil War, etc. And there are hints throughout it, like Pynchon is clearly foreshadowing uh, the racial issues and the, the government issues that would lead to the Civil War. The book is often described as a postmodern novel, which you, I don't think of postmodern novels 
typically as being kind of historical novels. <laughs> I think of them as kind of contemporary or maybe even kind of science fictional near future perhaps. But uh, there's no reason because really uh, postmodernism is about kind of narration and narrative, which is Pynchon's, what's the, coupe de jour? Is that a word? <laughs> I don't know. It's his cup of tea. It's uh, something that he visits a lot. So in this book, supposedly this whole narrative of Mason and Dixon is being told like around a, a, you know, a fireplace to this family. I'm kind of unclear. That part of the, the story that this is the frame, narr the frame sequence with these characters, all those characters seem kind of flimsy to me. There's, I think there's a guy named Reverend Cherry Coke, which is, Pynchon loves ridiculous names. And uh, the, the, you would even tell this story, I think there are kids present, which is just ridiculous in parts. Uh, so uh, things like that are part of the narration, but then within the story there are tangents and uh, the voice of Pynchon and who is telling the story is constantly moving sometimes and it's, uh, I don't know, I love that stuff, but I think I could see how people don't like that stuff. <laughs> they want a, a narration that they can follow that is, this is fact, this is actually happening, this is uh, clearly determined. Throughout the book, in addition to Mason and Dixon, there are real historical figures that show up, such as George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, uh, later in the book, Boswell and Johnson uh, show up. But uh, a lot of the characters are clearly fictional as well. So this, this kind of murkiness is, is similar to what I was talking about with narration. I think it, Pynchon loves that he has this, this, this frame, but he can also fill it out. And some of the things that he includes are pretty ridiculous and clearly fiction, but um, I don't know, they're, they're enjoyable. Like they even, there's one part where uh, Dixon talks about, cause he has, he thinks that the, the earth is hollow, hollow earth theories, which is, Pynchon's all about conspiracy theories. So hollow earth theories is, is a theory that the earth is actually hollow and there's a secret society in there and so on. So uh, at one point Dixon is narrating to Mason after they had split and later meet that he traveled to, I think Norway and went really far to, far to the North Pole and that was where he was able to enter into the center of the earth. Uh, it's kind of unclear how silly this is meant to be, but I think that that kind of uh, flexibility and plasticity is, is Pynchon's, yeah, it's his cup of tea. So if you've read Thomas Pynchon's first novel, V, you may walk away with the impression that I had that Pynchon was very influenced, at least at that time, by the beat authors, especially Jack Kerouac and William Burroughs. And if you know William Burroughs, one of his things that he's known for, maybe more than his actual stories, is that uh, this technique of the cut-up in uh, one of his novels, Naked Lunch, was essentially not a real cut-up, because, but I think Allen Ginsberg kind of, kind of assembled it so that it would have some kind of narrative flow, but it really it's these kind of disparate sections that are kind of joined together. And this is something that Brian Geisen and Burroughs would develop even more in, in like the cut up trilogy that Burroughs calls it. It's, uh, that's really too experimental for some people. They, they just can't stand it. There's no traditional elements of fiction that you, that you want in a lot of books. So, um, anyways, I think Pynchon, this is my theory, and part of the problem with Pynchon is that we don't have a lot of biographical information about him, and uh, we don't have interviews with him or anything like that. So, who knows? <laughs> but my theory, based on the text alone, is that, yes, he was influenced by the Beats, and Burroughs, I think he, my impression is that he did employ cut-ups to some degree around like Gravity's Rainbow. I feel like in that book, the disjointed nature of each chapter, that it has almost a modular feel. Each chapter stands partially alone and there are just some wild swervings. And I think Pynchon maybe used it, the cut up a little, but I think he also, you know, revised heavily and polished it so that it was a more readable narrative. But I think the basis of that is cut up or, you know, insert this idea of inserting, uh, folding in different parts that aren't necessarily connected and then kind of just fusing them and reworking them until they do 
come together in some way. So I, I think Gravity's Rainbow is for me pinching full on rock and roll, punk energy of discarding traditional narrative uh, requirements and instead of just telling the story that he wants to tell. And also I think he was doing a lot of weed at the time, but again, who knows. Uh, but with Mason and Dixon, I feel like it's much more, I don't want to say it's a retreat into a formality of, of writing, but it's a more accessible kind of popular take on narrative. And, uh, but still beside, even with that caveat, there is a lot of tangents <laughs> and I would think that I'm tempted to call fold-ins or, um, just maybe they were began as short stories or who knows, but, um, Somewhere I remember reading, maybe it's on Wikipedia, the biography of Pynchon, but there was a letter that Pynchon wrote, I think to his agent at the time in the 60s or 70s, describing how he was at work on all these, these books and how, like, if, if even if a few of them came across, they'd be, he, he clearly had this vision of these epic books. And later on, he would release these three massive books, Gravity's Rainbow, um, Mason and Dixon against the day. My theory is that he didn't write them consecutively and that, you know, finish one, go on to the next. I think he worked on one and maybe put it aside for years, maybe came back to it or whatever, because when you're working on something that vast, trying to edit it and keep it all in your head and just writing it, you need to put some distance between it before you can edit it. So I, I think he worked on these books for years and maybe even decades. Um, there seems to be different levels to his style that like later books, Inherent Vice, I think he definitely wrote, um, you know, in one go, I feel like that's not a book that he sat around on. And I feel like that style, the writing style on that is pretty straightforward. But some of these books, Mason and Dixon against the day really has some very different writing styles. And, uh, but in Mason and Dixon too, even with this kind of slightly more, um, what do you call that when a character's kind of travel, a journey novel? I, I forget the term for that. But anyways, when that's your format and you're basing it on biography, uh, he still manages to include these, these wild tangents that are um, sometimes very fantastical. I was also thinking as I read this about some of the musical references. There are actually quite a bit, and I think they go beyond just um, casual um, listener of music. It could be the case, but again, this is something that I'd be fascinated to know. Did Pynchon have any musical background? I wouldn't be surprised if growing up he played piano or something, but who knows? Now let me talk a little about some of the difficulties with Pynchon. You've probably heard that he's a difficult author, and he is, but I mean, he's more difficult than some authors, but uh, there's just kind of a few things to get around. So here's how I suggest you read Mason and Dixon. Use the Wikipedia entries for, read first about Mason and Dixon, the historical people. Don't, uh, just read about their lives. It's very short. <laughs> and then also look at the entry on the book itself on Wikipedia, which has, there, uh, either there or there's a separate entry with all this, the episodes. It's like a 78 chapter book. So each chapter has a, like a one paragraph summary. And I think either before or after reading each chapter, just look at that summary so you can kind of keep up with all pension that's going on. He, what he does a lot though, is he'll introduce a situation or a character and just give it like one or two sentences and then he'll switch into conversation and have these vast blocks of dialogue. And if you missed that first sentence and you like, there was a character or a historical reference that you're not aware of, you're going to be kind of lost for a lot of that foregoing uh, conversation. So uh, use the summaries and uh, follow up on those Wikipedia links to see if any figures or key ideas that you need to know. But also there are annotations online that you can look at if you really want to know every detail. As I was reading, I think the thing that I understood least is all the references to surveying because they were doing surveying of the land. I don't even know. They used like a little thing device and trigonometry. I don't know. See, that's what I'm saying. Like there's all these references to things like obs and stuff that I just, I'm sure if you really want to understand the 
you know, the science of surveying and all that you can, but I don't feel like it's totally necessary. So do I recommend it? I think for some people, absolutely, but not for everyone. This is a very difficult book. It's, if you don't want such a challenge, then don't read it. But it's, a, I don't even know how to describe a book that's been with me for, I don't know, five or six months. I've slowly read it and these characters feel very real to me, at least the main two characters. So um, yeah, it's a, a powerful life-changing book. The text is, I mean, it's just such beautiful prose. There are actually <laughs> poem sections that are written by this fictitious poet. I think his name's Timothy Talks. And he wrote this, supposedly he wrote this uh, epic poem called the Pennsylvaniad. We just get views of Pynchon as a poet, which he does in other books too. But reading it is just such a powerful experience because even when, even when you're lost or even when the most uh, kind of basic things are happening, the prose is just so well written. It's like you could pick up the King James Bible or you could pick up Chaucer and just read it because he knew how to put, they knew how to put, you know, words together. The vision that the book contains, the lifetimes and the scale differences from empires to the most microscopic and unimportant little details are all covered and it's just, yeah, it's, it's, you feel not only that you've encountered these lives, the, the characters in the book, but also Pynchon, who's, who lived with this book, I'm sure, for years and uh, carried it with him in his head, all these ideas and all these, I mean, there's just so much going on. It's just, some of the, the chapters are just incredibly, like they're some of the best writing I've ever read. Not for everyone, but I hope to read it again one day.